before we get to today's show, just a quick reminder that you can get the most comprehensive digest of China Africa news delivered daily to your email inbox. Try it out at chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa-China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, we're joined by CAPS Managing Editor Kobus van Staden from Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, there's a lot going on right now in the great power competition space, in geopolitical thinking. Obviously, the war in Ukraine has changed so much of how we are seeing the world right now. And you've been doing a lot of writing over the past few weeks on this issue of how does Africa fit in the new narrative about great powers and global rivalries and all of that. Well, we've got a little bit of an insight also in U.S. thinking on this over the past, say, oh, four or five weeks. This is the season every year when the big generals come to Washington to make their case in front of Congress. And this is part of an annual ritual where they basically want to justify their particular region of operation, their particular service, so that Congress then puts funding into their bucket. And so this, uh, it was very interesting for us because China was a prominent theme in a lot of the testimonies. And the ones that we're going to focus on are from General Kenneth McKenzie, who's a U.S. Marine Corps commander for Central Command, CENTCOM, as many people know it. Also, longtime listeners of the show will be familiar with General Stephen Townsend, who is the Africa commander and known as AFRICOM that's based out of Stuttgart, Germany. And so they appear before the Senate Armed Services Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, and then the House Appropriation Subcommittee on Defense. Now, this is a little bit inside baseball for how the U.S. government works in terms of its funding process. So remember that the politics here are all about appropriations and money. But what I'd like to do is set up our conversation today with a few sound bites from those hearings, because I think it will really play well to Cobus as some of the ideas that you've been hashing out in our newsletter and some of your writing, and then, of course, our conversation uh, with Dawn coming up later. So let's start with uh, Sasha Baker, who's the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. She was speaking alongside General McKenzie, again, who's the CENTCOM commander. For those of you not familiar, CENTCOM is the region of the world which goes basically from the Middle East all the way out to Afghanistan and South Asia. So that is a very popular command for the United States, obviously a lot of activity. And a lot of the questioning that came from the both the House and Senate legislators was about China and Russia. And let's take a listen to what Sasha Baker had to say with regards to China. It's clear to us, I think, that strategic competition has come to the Middle East and perhaps has been there for quite some time. And so we do see China and Russia uh, but particularly China, looking for economic and other inroads uh, with some of our partners and allies. As General McKenzie said, from a defense perspective, we believe that those relationships are strong, that we remain the partner of choice, and that there are things that we bring to the table and that we're offering to partners and allies in the region uh, that, frankly, uh, China and others can't match. That's a very different narrative than what we've been following in the Middle East, where everybody is talking about a retreat of the United States in terms of engagement, that the U.S. has lost interest, and also that the Chinese now are moving in economically, but also potentially even on the security side as well. So again, contrasting views coming out of Washington. Let's turn now to General Stephen Townsend. Uh, he's going to bring up a number of different themes that we've talked about on this show quite a bit. But let's take a listen to what he told the House Armed Services Committee. China has made a decision, a deliberate decision, to compete with America and Africa and win that competition. They compete primarily through economic means and diplomatic means. Uh, and you can see that there with their Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they're comp they are investing everywhere across the continent. We don't actually have to meet that competition in every location head on. 
we have to pick and choose where we're going to do that. And uh, there are uh, countries where it's important uh, that we do. And the military sphere, you heard in the, the chairman's opening remarks there that they have their one overseas base in Djibouti. Uh, the, the primary thing that concerns me with China's uh, military uh, competition in Africa is that they are seeking, actively seeking, a military base on the Atlantic coast of Africa. And for a variety of reasons that I will go to in closed session, that would be bad for America's security. Uh, and uh, we, as a first priority, we need to uh, prevent, uh, a ch a deter a Chinese base in the Atlantic coast of Africa. Okay, so if you've been following the show and if you're a subscriber to the newsletter, you will know that we have been tracking every single comment of General Townsend on this issue dating back to March of last year when he first told the Associated Press about this idea that the Chinese were looking at uh, locating a base in West Africa. We have challenged that perception. And Kobus, in fact, you wrote a very compelling argument, a counter-narrative in foreign policy in March, challenging that assumption. Let me get a, one more piece of sound, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. But now, actually, we're starting to piece this together because General Townsend has not provided any evidence or any detail about this purported base. Also, in the Chinese literature, that is, think tanks, uh, the PLA universities, the media, the universities, think tanks, anywhere, there is no discussion, none, talking about any West Coast base in the Atlantic Ocean. This is just not on the discussion. Most of what we're seeing in the Chinese literature is all focused on the Indian Ocean and in the South China Sea and here in Southeast Asia. There's a lot of discussion about basings in places like Cambodia, none in West Africa. So we really kind of thought, hmm, this is kind of unusual. Then last week, Rear Admiral Jamie Sands, head of the Navy Special Operations Command in Africa, he held a press briefing for African media and he was speaking from Stuttgart, Germany, which is where AFRICOM is headquartered. And he said some things that finally start to bring this whole puzzle together. Let's take a listen. He was asked a question by Today News Africa. I've put the question in there, and let's listen to his answer. So first, we'll hear the question from Today News Africa. Uh, this is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington. AFRICOM commander recently also testified in Congress and one against the naval base that the Chinese are building in, want to build in West Africa. And I, I was just wondering how, uh, if you could explain how that naval uh, base is not, is a threat to the U.S. national security. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the AFRICOM commander's testimony and, and his emphasis on the importance of preventing China from establishing a naval foothold on the west coast of Africa and why that's important, I would offer that it's simply a matter of geography. The closer uh, a Chinese naval presence is to the east coast of the United States or North America, uh, the, the shorter the distance required to transit, uh, the greater, or the, the re, excuse me, the, the response time for the United States would be decreased. Uh, and that's not something that we're, uh, we, we want to accept. And so I think that would, if, if that may give you some additional insight into the why behind uh, General Townsend's concern about any sort of establishment of a Chinese base on the west coast of Africa. Aha, now we're getting somewhere. Kobus, this has been a mystery for us for a very long time, but now we finally have some insights. Okay, we first started to figure out what was happening because there was a great military blog, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes, that said this is really about submarine bases because the longest uh, Chinese ICBM has a range of 5,500 miles. That means it can reach from China, uh, an ICBM can reach the West Coast or the Western United States, but cannot reach targets in the eastern seaboard, Washington, New York, Atlanta, for example. Having a submarine base on the west coast of Africa speaks to this issue of, ge of geography that Admiral Sands was talking about. So now all of a sudden, if there's a resupply base for Chinese submarines, they can then push those submarines into the Atlantic and their ICBMs then all of a sudden now are reachable within range of Washington and New York. And this is why, in my view, and just based on the assumptions, again, all speculation. I make no no pretense to have any insight beyond what you've heard and what we've read in the public record. But 
we think this is more and more about submarines and having access to the Atlantic Ocean to launch ICBMs from the Atlantic. And that was what is giving General Townsend some sweats at night and why he's so concerned about this base. Once again, let me be very, very clear here. There is no public evidence whatsoever coming from the Chinese who have said nothing on this or that the United States government or the military has put forward to support the proposition. But when Admiral Sands is talking about geography, and that is what the only thing that we can think of in this military blog on submarines, I think really kind of is the best case for why the United States is so concerned about its national security of having a Chinese military base in a place like Equatorial Guinea. Kobus, let me drop it off there for you, and let's hear what you think. Yeah, this this definitely adds a clue to the to the conversation because you know we we the, the question we ask is you know as, as you said like why isn't there more chatter on on the Chinese side about this base if they're really planning it and then also you know kind of how much of a of a security threat would it be considering that the United States has has numerous bases you know you know all over Africa and that it is and also you know all, all of its allies in Europe are also close by so this this does seem to make a lot of sense but i think it raises some other questions it's it's very interesting to see to see the kind of contrast between chinese discussions of 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 africa which is which is obviously as as we've we've couched as as we've outlined many times you know, like they, they they really kind of push a, a narrative of constancy, and and even though the the, the balance of strength between them is, is completely out of whack, um, a, a kind of a narrative of south south solidarity and cooperation. You know, um, co- cooperation on many different levels, and so it is then very interesting to see on the U.S. side the discussion of of Africa as essentially a big land mass too close to the US or more specifically as a potential theater for conflict you know and and i think that that kind of framing of africa as essentially a kind of a you know an empty space that is that provides a theater for for great power conflict that is i think why african countries are so worried about about a new cold war and why they are so resistant against against quote being pushed to choose sides and we've seen that narrative gain a lot of strength during the ukraine conflict where you know kind of china actually managed to make quite a lot of hay out of this idea that that the west is trying to to force sovereign countries to choose sides um and one can see you know kind of the 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 original cold war kind of roots of that of those fears There's definitely instincts of the Cold War that are coming back. But again, we are in a different era. Is it the Cold War, the new Cold War, the post-post-Cold War, an alternative world order? Not quite sure, but there is a fantastic new book that just came out, China's Rise in the Global South, the Middle East, Africa, and Beijing's Alternative World Order by Associate Professor of International Security Studies at the U.S. Air War College, Don Murphy. Don joins us from Montgomery, Alabama. A very good morning to you, Dawn. Good morning, and thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have you. The timing of this discussion is fantastic, as you've just heard from some of the testimonies that we we featured. We'd love to get your take on some of that. Just before, very quickly before we get started, whenever we talk with people who work for any government, including the United States government, we do want to emphasize that Dawn is joining us on her own behalf and as a scholar, but not as a spokesperson or representative of the government. Okay, with that out of the way, we'd love to dive into some of the themes that you kind of explored in the book. You mentioned in the opening of your book that you felt that there are some big gaps in the scholarship in terms of understanding China's interest in the global south, especially in places like Africa and the Middle East. And you said, and let me quote here, that the need to examine China's behavior outside of Asia is increasingly urgent. Let's start our conversation there. And what do you think is missing in the discourse when it comes to looking at China in both the Middle East and in Africa? And then again, vis-a-vis the United States. So increasingly, as China has a global presence, which really started more kind of 2000-ish going forward, um, with that presence, I think we need to have a much stronger understanding of China's interests, of its behavior, and the way in which that potentially is competing with other powers, and the ways in which that interacts with the liberal order. And as I'm sure you're aware... um, Scholarship up till up till this point often has focused on dynamics in Sino-American relations or in China's behavior in 
Asia, especially in East Asia. And my work shows that in many ways, China's interests may be a bit different in other regions of the world and its behavior as well. And uh, you know, which main differences do you see, like, you know, kind of comparing be between those kind of areas that get a lot more attention and these areas that you're looking at? So first of all, if you think about East Asia, China has a number of territorial disputes and, and lingering historical issues in that particular region. When you look at Middle East and Africa, China's interests are primarily economic for attempting to acquire resources and markets, wanting support from states broadly all throughout Africa and the Middle East for it in the international system, whether that's in international organizations um, or on a bilateral basis. It also, especially in the Middle East and Africa, um, wants support from countries in those regions to ensure China's own domestic stability. And so what I mean by that is to have countries, especially in those regions, to not criticize its behavior on internal issues, whether that's Xinjiang or, or Hong Kong or, or other issues that deal directly with China's sovereignty. Also, increasingly, especially since 2000, they have a lot more businesses and citizens that, that are working and living in regions, Middle East, Africa, as well as the rest of the global south, that increasingly there's more of a demand for them to be able to protect those citizens. And finally, in, in recent years, as the competitive dynamic between the U.S. and China has increased in various ways, there's more of a desire to have countries in these regions and throughout the global south to support China in its claims, whether it be regarding the South China Sea, um, uh, other territorial disputes, etc. So I see the main difference between East Asia um, and the rest of the world, particularly the global South, is that China doesn't have any territorial claims or disputes in that way. It's primarily its interests are economic and political. It's interesting that both you and General Townsend emphasize the economic relationship in Africa, and, and respectfully, I, I see that in different terms. Uh, last year, China did $254 billion of trade with Africa, f but globally, China did $6.05 trillion. So Africa's contribution to China's trade balance was about 3%. That's not a very important economic relationship. Most of what China buys from Africa, China can source elsewhere on the Belt and Road. Of course, the cobalt and lithium now is the exception to that. But the vast majority of oil, mineral, and timber that Africa sells to, to China can be bought in Brazil, South Asia, even in Russia. So I guess for me, I, I think it's this emphasis on the politics now that is much more. And you've talked about how that it's in preservation of China's domestic interests as well. But talk a little bit about this alternative world order that Africa and increasingly the Middle East is becoming important for China to rally around these causes. This is where the Africa and the Middle East diverge a little bit because economically the Middle East is very important to China, but Africa not so much, but politically both are important. So this question of the balance between economics and politics and also this question of the alternative world order, I'd like to hear more from you on that. So I completely agree with your assessment regarding the magnitude of economic activity, whether you look at trade, foreign investment, et cetera, um, that there are other regions that are very important. And so I'm not trying to imply that a Africa, for example, is the most important region for China economically. It's just going, especially looking at the post-Cold War era and from 2000 forward, China's, my, my assessment is that China's primary driver has been economic. That said, to your point, these regions, I would say, increasingly are, being come, are becoming important in China gaining political support in the international system. And I would say the reason why these regions are particularly important is that the norms that China is advocating for in the international system tend to, and in these regions in particular, tend to revolve around sovereignty and a very strict interpretation of Westphalian sovereignty, where there's many countries, although not all, obviously, in these regions, particularly due to a, a colonial history that also have a very strong focus on sovereignty. So that is a, a shared interest. There's also a very long lineage of China advocating for various forms of South-South cooperation that goes back all the way to the Mao era and has changed in form over time. But the South-South peace and, and sharing interests in ensuring that the international order more broadly represents those interests is something that 
China, I think, gets a lot of um, traction with those norms in these particular regions. Another piece in the Middle East, in particular, uh, much more tied into China's historical support for the Palestinians, um, although since 1992, they have very strong relations with Israel, as well as the Palestinians. Um, China very much sees itself as a, a great power that has the ability to contribute to peace in the region, and that this shared interest in resolving that issue, you know, also resonates with large parts of the global south. So as relations in particular between the U.S. and China start to sour, many of these, you know, countries in the global south share a lot of China's broader interests in the international order. And when I refer to an alternative order in my own work, what I'm referring to is, is the very broad suite of foreign policy tools that China has been um, building ever since the early 2000s, whether that be cooperation forums, obviously one for the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, as well as the China-Arab States Cooperation Forum. It's special envoys that it's established for the Middle East peace process, for contributing to um, resolution of the Darfur issue in, in the mid-2000s and then increasingly on South Sudan in the, the early 2010s. The 2016 envoy they established for... Uh, attempting to contribute to, to resolution of issues in Syria, as well as you know, very recently the announcement of a, a Horn of Africa special envoy. And then a much broader suite of foreign policy tools, you know, whether it be special economic zones, agricultural demonstration centers, strategic partnerships, um, etc. So I see this entire constellation of various institutions that they're establishing as not something that they're attempting to replace a current liberal order. But if either the current liberal order starts to unravel, or if China is excluded from the, the current either liberal or um, liberal economic or political order, that they have these alternative institutionalized ways to interact with Africa, Middle East, and in many ways with, with most parts of the global south um, that would ensure that going forward, regardless of whether they're in the international order or not, they would continue to have robust relations. So that's what I mean when I say an alternative world order. That point, I think, is really interesting because, you know, so so frequently we hear critics of China um, essentially saying that China wants to replace the rules-based liberal order, um, or frequently also that China is actually conspiring with Russia to replace the rules, the, the rules-based international order. And a, a lot of a lot of the book focuses on on whether China is norm divergent or norm convergent. You know, whether whether it differs from from the con current norms and to, to which extent it conforms to them. Um, you know, on a, on a kind of a broad canvas, like how did it shake out? Like kind of how, how norm divergent is China actually when, when you actually look at it on the ground? So you see more, and, and when I say norm divergent, I'm referring to norm divergence from the liberal order as opposed to Westphalian, Westphalian sovereignty. And as I stated earlier, China is a very strong supporter of Westphalian sovereignty. So its, it's behavior in general is, is quite convergent with that. But when looking at the liberal order, you tend to see kind of a, um, a difference between political, economic, and foreign aid behavior and military. So that's the first major division is the foreign policy tools that I look at in the security realm, all of those pretty much fall into the convergent category. So, for example, the security cooperation that's occurring in the cooperation forums or United Nations peacekeeping operations or anti-piracy, you know, in off the Gulf of Aden, all of this is being done through multilateral organizations, often through the United Nations. And even when you look at conventional arms sales, other than the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, you have a very low amount of um, conventional arms sales, which very much is in alignment with a norm of nonproliferation and not wanting to contribute to that. But then when you look in the political and economic sphere, you've got a, a real um, interesting situation where there's certain aspects of the liberal order that their behavior is very much convergent with. So some examples of that in the economic sphere, in their trade with the least developed countries, they very much promote 
tariff-free trade, which is very much in alignment with the liberal order to, for the poorest countries in the system to receive that type of special treatment. They also are pursuing free trade agreements. So whether that's with the Gulf Cooperation Council or Israel or Mauritius or other regions, they um, have, you know, that that's very much in alignment with the World Trade Organization and with the broader liberal order. Or Interacting with multilateral development finance, you know, whether that's the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or, you know, the World Bank, et cetera. There, there's a lot of ways in which they leverage multilateral finance. And so in, in the, the economic sphere, there's a number of ways in which their behavior actually converges. And I would also say in the political sphere, there's a number of ways in which their behavior converges. And that, you know, for example, would be around using, wanting to use multilateralism to resolve issues like the Middle East peace process or Syria, um, or the um, promotion of South-South cooperation more broadly in their political interactions with the global south. And so I highlight those things first, because I think in many ways, analysts tend to focus on the norm divergent aspects. But there are a number of ways in which China very much is, is converging with the liberal order. But then on the divergent side, those pieces tend to be around really having a hard interpretation of sovereignty that very much in a lot of ways is in tension with the liberal political order. And then on the economic front, having um, a number of aspects of the relationship in, between state and market in their economic engagement, both obviously domestically in their own country, but um, globally, that that is in tension with many free market and you know, open trade norms of the liberal order. Um, which part of, you know, what falls into that category would be government support for Chinese companies. Often that diverges. Um, foreign aid is another area that you would be very familiar with, especially in these regions, uh, that although China does not have political conditionality with its foreign aid, um, it does have some economic conditionality, but that often also diverges from the liberal order. So those are just a few examples, but I would say primarily the political and economic behavior tends to diverge from the order in certain ways, and the military behavior tends to converge. Just before we go too deep into the conversation, you've mentioned the liberal international order and the Westphalian. Could you just quickly define those terms, just in case some of our, our listeners don't have a full understanding of what those two definitions are? Absolutely. So the Westphalian order is, especially in Chinese terms, um, they often refer to the five principles of peaceful coexistence. But Westphalian order is the idea of sovereignty, non-intervention, and non-interference in the domestic order of states as a paramount norm in the international system. So if you think about the United Nations and many other aspects of the international system, this is one of the bedrocks of that order. So that's what I mean by Westphalian sovereignty. When I talk about the liberal order, I'm primarily talking on the political side, the promotion of human rights, democracy, um, more broadly as liberal norms that are encompassed within that order. One of the defenses that you hear coming out of Washington is to protect the liberal international order and that China wants to upset it overthrow it, create an alternative world order, as you've talked about. That's very threatening to a lot of American stakeholders. And, and I guess the part that I'm struggling with and what we hear coming out of many, many different places in the global south is that the United States is highly selective, as all great powers are, in how much it wants to accommodate or upset the international order that it deems to protect. So, for example, people will bring up uh, the Iraq War, they'll bring up Guantanamo Bay, they'll bring up the fact that the United States isn't a member of the ICC, the list, the International Criminal Court, the list goes on and on that the United States itself tries to bend the order to suit its interests and does not always adhere to the rules of war and to all the different protocols of the liberal international order. China comes along and is trying to bend the system into its favor as the world's second largest economy. That's kind of what happens in world history. And yet now it's a defense of the, the world order and the international order that the United States itself has really been cavalier in some respects over the past 30 years. 
President Trump himself with the use of sanctions. The WTO consistently said that that was in violation of international rules. So again, it just seems a little bit odd looking at it from the point of view of the global south towards the United States that when China's involved, now the United States finds religion when it comes to defending the international order, as opposed to the fact that China as as an emerging great power, if not a great power today, is basically doing the same thing in terms of trying to bend it to its interests. How do you see that that debate? So the way I look at this is the U.S. was very instrumental in establishing the, the current liberal order, especially in a post-World War II environment. I am not equating U.S. behavior to support for the liberal order. I would agree with your assessment. There are many ways in which the U.S., as well as other great powers, frequently engage in behavior that is not supportive of the liberal order, whether it be economic or political. So first of all, I'm not, I'm absolutely not saying that China's behavior is diverging from the liberal order in certain ways, but the U.S. is completely converging. I I don't think that's true at all. Um, What I am trying to look at in my own work is the idea of the ways in which China's behavior is converging or diverging, because I do think that that can cause tension more broadly with the U.S. you know, or the West when we are at a time when the U.S. from um, a broader approach is emphasizing the liberal order. And I mean, as you know, obviously, the, the U.S. has emphasized it in, in various ways. And clearly, as I've already stated, there, there are many ways in which we do not, including the examples that you just provided, that the U.S. does not conform with that. But my own work is wanting to look at very, in a very micro way so we can better understand the behavior and partially also to highlight that there are lots of ways in which China is supportive of the order. And my own work is is trying to respond to a lot of the analysis of China as a rising power that, you know, as you said, many of those assessments tend to give this very broad brush, China's revisionist or China's status quo, China's trying to completely overturn the order, et cetera. And I think a much more useful way to look at that is to understand very specific aspects of the order and understand, you know, in what ways is that supportive of the order? Order, in what ways is it intention? And then, you know, what does that mean? So it, it is not, my work is not trying in any way to say that the U.S. is completely, is converging or is completely supporting all those norms while China's a great power. Because I, I do agree with your assessment that often great powers and often countries in the system, regardless of their rhetoric, do ha- engage in behavior that, that fundamentally diverges with that order. I think one of the complications of of this discussion is that it's it's so difficult to to separate the the liberal international order as it exists as a kind of an abstract ideal or an abstract kind of set of systems from the the you know the the kind of the unipolar system particularly after the cold war that entrenched it in the form that that we see it now you know um so that then leads to to discussions of of China's rise and it's and therefore it's you know kind of the you know the pressure of for the United States to kind of make space for it kind of in the world that challenge to United States hegemony then becomes the same thing as a challenge to the international order or to the international liberal order. Um, and I was wondering how that played out in your mind as you were writing the book, particularly in relation to this issue of norms, you know, kind of the issue of, of norms as they sit, you know, as a kind of a platonic ideal, you know, kind of in sitting in the sky somewhere, um, the norms that we all trying to kind of aspire to or kind of move towards and then the actual the actual kind of lived norms the way that the US and and its allies are you know are are imposing them um and you know and and the the reason i'm asking this is because africa frequently falls in between those two chairs you know the like it like in 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 theory africa you know africa is liberated and and enabled in all kinds of ways by the liberal international order in practice a lot of that is contingent on the particular kind of mood in places like Washington, New York, and, and London. Um, so I was wondering, you know, kind of how you thought of that particular issue as you were writing the book. 
So I, I think there's two dynamics uh, of this issue. So one is in China's behavior in, in the global south and in the Middle East and Africa in particular. And the other piece is actually in bilateral Sino-American relations. And, and that's not really covered as much in the book, but, but I'll say a few words about that because I think that's actually where the greater tension tends to be around some of these liberal norms in that China as another great power in the system that has a fundamentally different conception of the relationship between state and market results globally or in bilateral economic relations, et cetera, in often having behavior that's going to diverge from the liberal order. And I think as Chinese companies in particular and China, you know, as a state is increasing in, in power, there's there are more tensions in the Sino-American relationship because the the perception domestically within the U.S. is that Chinese companies are are being subsidized. Chinese companies are are having a operating on an unfair playing field or U.S. companies operating within China um, uh, don't have the, the, the protection of a lot of those liberal norms, you know, internally within China. So I think that actually causes quite a bit of you know, friction in the, the broader economic relationship. And then on the political side as well, especially when we start looking at, at issues in, you know, whether it be Xinjiang or the, the rollback of, of many various human rights within China, et cetera, that those divergences, you know, from the liberal order also starts to cause tension, you know, with the U.S. as well as a number of other Western countries. In particular in the the Middle East and Africa, you know, obviously there's a wide range of governments and systems and and civil society groups, you know, etc. So those divergences, you know, very much could cause tensions locally. But what I've seen is that the perception that that China is trying to displace elements of the order is potentially what causes, you know, friction with the U.S. So if you look at, you know, Belt and Road and a a lot of the um, emphasis on debt issues associated with with projects or those not being sustainable, you know, et cetera, I I think a lot of that is is what's been emphasized. But a, a major part of my work is to more comprehensively across foreign policy tools understand China's behavior, because actually I think there's a lot more opportunity for cooperation rather than competition between the the U.S. and China. And again, my work highlights there's a number of areas, especially in the military realm, where at least up to this point, we haven't really seen that competitive behavior, that behavior that's that's diverging from liberal norms. And so a big point of, of the book is to try to show that although we're seeing a lot of, you know, increasing military tension, for example, in East Asia, that's not necessarily what we'll see from a rising China globally based on what we've seen to date. So I do think it's it's really important to look at, at these specifics. But to your point, the equation of challenging the liberal order broadly defined is very tied in with the idea of challenging a current hegemonic power. Um, and so th- these are multiple issues that are all very much related. You know, while I was reading your book, it made me happy in the one sense because you're starting to bring back this idea that there are competing ideas. And I think the United States, after the end of the Cold War, got very lazy in that realm. That Francis Fukuyama declared, we're at the end of history, that's it, democracy and capitalism won, Good night, everybody. The show's over. Lights out. This is the way it will be for the end of history. And we had this assumption that everybody was just going to fall into our orbit. And that was the assumption that we had about China. That was the Clinton assumption. That was even all the way up into Barack Obama, that if we engage China, if we make them help them become more capitalist, they will be inevitably more open and they will fall into the orbit of capitalism, which then will lead gracefully into democracy. Of course, that did not happen. And what we did not understand for the past 25 years is that the battle of ideas never stopped. We disengaged from it and and putting out ideas into the world. And in fact, President Obama was elected on the premise of retreating from the world in many respects, bring the soldiers home, let's stop the wars. 
And, and yet the Chinese came out with an offer to countries with the Belt and Road. We're going to focus on economic development. We're going to give you a governance model for the internet. You talked about sovereignty and this really hard edge definition of sovereignty. We're seeing that play out in Ethiopia right now. And there is a lot of appeal for the Chinese worldview and this, this Chinese ideological kind of framework that they're presenting to developing countries. And it's playing out over and over and over again. In disputes with the United States on Huawei, not one country in Africa has lined up behind the United States, and I don't think any in, in Latin America have either. On the question of Xinjiang, it's the United States has gone bust. On Even on Ukraine right now, it's basically a coalition of wealthy global North countries, and most of the global South is either staying on the sidelines or certainly not necessarily fully aligning with the West. My point here is, again, I like the fact that you're starting to bring up that the United States has to have some ideas, and there is a competition of ideas that is out there. Can you speak to a little bit of this question of the U.S. offer and the Chinese offer in places like the Middle East and Africa as it relates to the framing of the next generation of world orders that we're going to live in? So I would say that China differentiates itself and, and presents itself as a great power in these regions in Middle East and Africa, as well as much of the global South, as in a way that you, you've already mentioned a few elements of this, right? But as a defender of sovereignty, as a champion of development and South-South cooperation, as a promoter of connectivity broadly defined across you know, functional areas, whether that's economic or people-to-people, -people, technology, health, et cetera, but a promoter of connectivity, um, a great power that leverages international institutions that, you know, in many cases is, is using the United Nations, is wanting to have, you know, multilateral interactions. It presents itself as a balanced actor that has for the most part, globally positive relations with all countries in a region. So, so in the Middle East, for example, they have very strong relations with all of the members of the League of Arab States, as well as Iran, Israel, and Turkey. And so they present themselves as a balanced actor that in many regions of the world could contribute um, because they have such a, a positive relation. And then they emphasize their lack of colonial history in comparison in particular to um, to, to many Western countries. The, the U.S., I'm not going to speak to that as much because, you know, this book obviously is trying to understand China's a great power and how it portrays itself and, and the ways in which that could resonate with the global South. But as you're aware, historically, the U.S. has very much emphasized its promotion of, of democracy, of human rights, of the liberal economic order. And I would say in the current Biden administration, there's been more of a focus on multilateralism, you know, um, having interactions with partners, especially partners that, that share some of those economic and political values. But I do think for China, you know, first and foremost, we, we should take seriously how China's presenting itself as a great power, and that many of these ideas could resonate with, with large portions of the world. And that's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing for, for that to resonate. You know, many of these ideas regarding development and South-South cooperation have a lot of potential positive effects for countries throughout the, the global South. So I, I really just try to, to emphasize that so that we can better understand China as a great power in these regions and globally. When critics of China, um, particularly in Western countries, when, when they say that, that China would like to amend or change or, or replace the, the, the liberal international order with, a, with an order more to its making, there's then a very quick segue to, well, they're exporting authoritarianism or, you know, kind of, or they, they kind of want to make the world safe for, for, for a, a, a much more kind of uh, repressive regime. Um, like in, in, in your work, like what, what would a, a Chinese designed or Chinese centric uh, international order actually look like? So I would say that the norms behind it would be primarily sovereignty, um, as we've discussed before. Um, so on the political side, it would primarily be around the five principles of peaceful coexistence, particularly sovereignty. On the economic side, it would be an order that had room for a heavy level of state involvement, but still a lot of focus on multilateralism, potentially. Um, I also think that the... Um, 
at least to date, what we have seen from China has been a hesitancy to establish a broader um, military presence. You know, you've mentioned Djibouti is the, the first declared base that they've had overseas. And, and so that at this point, that footprint has been relatively minimal. Um, but on the norms, you know, to your point on exporting authoritarianism, I have not seen that in my own work as far as any sort of active promotion of either a Chinese political or economic model outside of a focus on sovereignty and uh, you know stressing that development is important and wanting to provide a, a wide range of tools to help facilitate development. But I, I don't, at this point, I don't see any sort of China model regarding how other countries' domestic systems should operate. The book is China's Rise in the Global South, the Middle East, Africa, and Beijing's Alternative World Order. There has never been a book that is more suited for the audience of this program and aligned with this program. It is very, very interesting. It's an important book to read. You can get it on Amazon, both in Kindle versions and in uh, in real life, IRL versions. Hard, I don't know if it's in uh, softback or hardback, but it is available on Amazon. Dawn Murphy is the author. She's an associate professor of international security studies at the U.S. Air War College in Montgomery, Alabama. Don, thank you so much for taking the time to share some of your insights on this book. Congratulations on the book, and uh, we hope to stay in touch with you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Kobus, I really do think that this book is an important contribution to the discourse. It's unfortunate that it's one of these expensive academic books, like $60, $70 to, to buy. But for those of you with the budgets, it's an important book. And I one of the things that I appreciated about it is how she made the connection between the Middle East and Africa. And that is not something that we see very often. That is something that you and I deal with quite a bit. And especially as we're moving more into the Arabic space quite a bit, there's a lot of parallels and similarities and, and, and synergies between the Middle East and Africa, and I thought that was really one of the most interesting parts of uh, of her book. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, and it's I, I think also the the dividing between military behavior and you know kind of an other behavior I thought was also really really an interesting division, um, and you know kind of showing that how how China kind of converges to international norms on on the military side is is a really refreshing account. You know, kind of I, I think it's 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 something that that's very valuable. One of the things that I find so interesting about following the China-Africa, China-Middle East discourse, or China in the world discourse in the United States, especially after listening to all these Senate and House hearings, is how there is just this amazing gap that exists that is below the political level at the staff and operational level. There's an amazing amount of nuance in the understanding of China in the U.S., And then as soon as you get to a certain level of politics, the stupidity just kicks in. And and it's just – it's shocking to me how that the U.S. is so blessed with some of the world's best think tanks, university scholars, private research firms who are doing all of this amazing analysis and research. It bubbles up and then it just hits a ceiling. And above that ceiling, it's just moronic, the discussion about China and Africa. And for any evidence of this, go turn on any of the Senate and House hearings about where China comes up as an issue. And you're just like, Bruh? I mean, it is just it's a parallel universe. And we've talked about this before in Africa, how in other parts of the world, mainly in African countries, how there is oftentimes a lack of research institutes, a lack of think tanks. And, and just because resources just aren't there. The United States is endowed with all of this, but doesn't feel like we're fully taking advantage of it. This is one of those books that I really, really hope that the congressional staffs are going to spend the time to read so that they can brief their bosses on the nuance that's needed in the discourse, because it really isn't there. Well, you know, I, I guess you know what you're what you're calling kind of this kind of dumb discourse at, at the top. Uh, you know, I guess another way of putting it might be that that it's kind of 
politically minded. You know that that these are people who are particularly speaking to a domestic audience, um, and that they know they know what they what 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 kind of supporters don't want to hear. But that implies that they actually have an understanding of the issues, and they're ignoring that in order to cater to. Uh, a, a, a more simplified audience. That may be the case with someone like Senator Marco Rubio, who's been around for a long time and has read a lot of the intelligence, sure. But a lot of these guys, they're suffering from massive China knowledge deficits. Massive. But, but you know, kind of, but, but beyond the, the China knowledge deficits, it's, it's also just a, a, a kind of a specific kind of political tunnel vision that I think is, is true on both sides. You know, so, so for recently, I've been reading these excerpts from Kevin Rudd's new book. Um, it's an Australian, former Australian prime minister, and he's quite a, quite a big China expert. He speaks, he's one of the few kind of Western leaders who actually speaks Mandarin. Um, and he um, he made the point, you know, it's an obvious point, but but it's still an interesting point for me that Xi Jinping speaks almost no English apparently, and he read he doesn't read English, and so his 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 worldview is filtered through through these kind of think tanks, you know, kind of like who who pr- produce a bunch of knowledge about the world and then package it and then cherry pick from there kind of what they feel would make sense within that political system and that cherry picking gets more and more intense the closer it gets to him and I think that a similar kind of process is true in the case of US policymakers too and of course none of them or very few of them speak Mandarin and you know and and in fact I think in in the current political climate you know a a presidential candidate who's fluent in Mandarin will have actually that would be definitely be turned against them in in the the race so there is a there is a kind of a, a a kind of a confirmation bias or a kind of a, a kind of a you know a, 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 there's a kind of self-selecting aspect there you know kind of where people people who are you know kind of where people who with less nuanced views of China tend to the, those views tend to kind of rise to the top you know um, and, and and I think in a lot of cases that isn't necessarily because these people don't understand the issues or that they don't have nuance it's because they're speaking to this particular audience and that they're speaking in a you know in a, in a political climate that's so polarized that anything any more nuance will be turned against them immediately and to be fair I think that it's a mirror situation in China as well. Uh, there's a lot of translation now coming out about the discourse at the think at the think tank among scholars about the U.S. and it's equally stupid. I mean, it's really equally stupid. I mean, it is just shocking to see that this is the kind of stuff that's floating up. So it, this is a little bit worrisome given how much is in play geopolitically right now that one has to worry about the information that is making it up to the senior leadership of both countries. And there are reasons for concern in both countries that they're being very poorly informed. We see the consequences in Ukraine of when a leader is so blind to good intelligence and doesn't have good intelligence about the consequences of what can happen. And, and again, I speak just to the United States since I'm more familiar with the ecosystem of ideas that's there. And it is what's what's painful is that there is a lot of good information there. What I've seen come out of Chinese think tanks about the United States makes me a little worried. It's not that sophisticated. It really is kind of crude. Um, We've talked to a number of Chinese, not policymakers, but stakeholders uh, you remember some CGTN journalists that we've spoken to and and other academics, and they have a very distorted view of the outside world, oftentimes filtered through their own prism. And and that's normal. Most countries, most people from most countries do that. But in these day in this day and age when the stakes are so high that getting things wrong can cost a lot, oof, it's 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 scary to think about. But again, that's why I did enjoy her book. I, I thought it was very, very good. Again, she wasn't trying to frame this as a defense of the liberal international order or the Westphalian system. But by suggesting that China wants to make an alternative order, it does it does read that way a little bit. Um, again, I'm not suggesting that she's saying it that way. I, I just have a hard time on this that, again, the Americans have found religion on the international order when for the four years under the Trump administration, they did nothing but tear that order down. And now they, they're back to it. But again, when the Republicans take control in two years, will they give that up again? And part of the liberal international order is faith and confidence in that system. And I'm not convinced that ASEAN countries out here in Southeast Asia or African countries have an enormous amount of confidence that the United States is going to be a reliable defender of that system. They will do it now because it suits their interests 
in the con- in the rivalry with the Chinese. But again, Guantanamo Bay is still open, and they have not closed it, and that is the ultimate violation of the liberal international order. What, what I find sometimes a little bit frustrating, in, and this is not this doesn't relate to Dawn specifically at all, um, but you know, is, is, is you know, kind of Western commentators who you know who who portray China. Um, as you know, this this kind of massive challenge to to a liberal international order, or, or a, a liberal order, you know, kind of within even within the global north, doesn't tend to acknowledge that that liberal order within the global north at the moment seems under siege. Um, you know, like we we're seeing abortion rights, LGBT rights being rolled back all over the United States. We're seeing Marine Le Pen, like very right wing candidate, like being second second in line in, in the in the French elections. We're seeing a lot of anti liberal movement all over the you know kind of the 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 the, the traditional bastions of, of 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 liberalism. You know, kind of like very like nasty anti kind of transgender kind of rhetoric in the UK, for example. There's, there's a lot of that, um, and so you know, kind of so so the, it is very interesting to see, particularly I think, you know, kind of senators like Marco Rubio, for example, would be criticizing China for rolling back a kind of a liberal international order while attacking that order at home. Um, so so I think I think you know, kind of that that kind of disjuncture I think raises a lot of doubts. I think about about kind of about what these people are actually talking about. Yeah, it's very interesting. Let's change gears here very quickly just before we go. Uh, I want to go back to a show that we did a couple of weeks ago when you and I had a discussion about Ukraine. I brought up this issue about the question of migrants who were crossing the border from Ukraine into Eastern Europe and how there's been a couple different discussions going on out there that black and brown refugees were being denied at the border, whereas whites were getting through, which of course is undeniable that that was happening. And, and I suggested that there is some more complexity in that argument beyond just race, that it has a lot to do with Slavic identity. Some folks took a lot of exception with that. And one of our listeners, uh, Michael in Shanghai, who's been a longtime listener, he was kind enough to put together some of his thoughts and his objections to that statement and share them with us. Let's take a listen to Michael from Shanghai. Hi, Eric. I first want to start off by saying that I'm a big fan of the podcast and a long-time listener. I always look forward to the latest podcast episode as it gives me a clearer picture of China-Africa relations by combining input from your China in Africa reporting with my experience as an African in China, especially at a time when travel in and out of China is near impossible. However, your response to the experiences of black and brown people fleeing Ukraine in the latest episode the Ukraine war and greater power politics in the global south, irked me. I completely understand your point of view about the region's history and how that has, is, and continues to lead to the mistreatment of marginalized groups based on Slavic identity. But the two situations shouldn't have been compared in the first place. There is an ongoing war with its own internal politics and the blatant mistreatment of Africans and other people of color not just within Ukraine, but in most of the neighboring countries they were trying to flee during the crisis. For someone listening to the podcast with little or no knowledge of these two separate things, your conversation seemed to have melded them into one, with black and brown experiences taking the back seat, by being roped into the greater narrative of Slav identity and the region's racial politics. In the end, both issues exist within the same space and should have been answered separately, based on the events that took place. The reality is, this is a train of thought that distracts from the actual experiences of the individuals whose humanity was, is, and will continue to be diminished based on the color of the skin or the password that they hold. As a Kenyan expatriate, I am well aware that I would face the same challenges if anything similar was to occur in any country outside of the African continent that I would happen to be in, regardless of the politics surrounding the conflict. Anyway, Thank you for the opportunity to share a point of view that often gets overlooked. I shall continue to look forward to all the new content you are sure to provide in the future. Michael, I mean, thank you so much for that comment. You are 100% correct. We always thought of this show as an exchange. 
And he's absolutely right. And I stand 100% corrected that melding those two issues together was not the right way to look at it. And so fantastic, Michael. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Completely agree. So if you would like to send your comments in, agree, disagree, we'd love to air more of these comments. Uh, go ahead and reach out to me, eric at chinaafricaproject.com. You can record it on your phone. You can send it as an attachment. Let me know. I can give you well, my WhatsApp number, all sorts of different things in order to express your thoughts and your feedback. We'd love to have this. If you would like to write a letter, we also publish letters to the editor on our site in, in our newsletter. So that is something that we'd like to do as well. But we do love these exchanges. And also we love it when our our audience, smart folks like, like Michael, call us out and make us smarter through this discussion. So again, thank you, Michael, for that. Let's leave the conversation there. Cobus Knight will be back again next week with another episode. We're now ramping back up again to do two shows a week. So expect that in your feed. So for Cobus Van Staten, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. For more information about the China Africa Project, go to chinaafricaproject.com. 